And so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 for our Sunday school lesson today. And we're going to be continuing our study of this paragraph in encompassing verses uh, 22 through chapter 6, verse 9, where Paul is addressing uh, three major uh, relationship paradigms. We're going to be talking about, uh, we're already talking about the wife and the husband, and we're going to be talking about the parents with the children, and then we're going to be talking about the master and servant. And last lesson, particularly, we looked at uh, verse 25 after reviewing verses 21 through 24 from the perspective of the husband. Uh, we discussed that the whole paragraph has something for everyone here to learn and to understand. And I wanted to point out in relation to this concept that God doesn't have a men's only section of the Bible or a women only section of the Bible. Uh, like the satanic masons have their men only meetings and their women only meetings. Uh, God doesn't segregate also the Bible like Darwin and his evolution theory does into different social classes uh, depending on what he defines as race and evolution. Uh, which are terms prop improperly applied. Uh, I think about on our form for whenever we sell a firearm at the pawn shop, it has a qu two questions on the form. One is, what is your race? And you have to choose Hispanic or not Hispanic. Go figure why they have that as an important question. And then the second question is your ethnicity, which is you know white or black, and this is a government form, and we're not supposed to discriminate between white and black, you know, by calling people black or calling people white, or instead of Caucasian and African American. Uh, this form actually says white and black, and, he, and it somehow thinks that you can differentiate between ethnicity and race. No, we're all the human race. Well, the Bible says we're all of one blood. We're all on equal footing, uh, not just mentally and physically, uh, but also spiritually, and all of us are capable of the same things, uh, but not according to Darwin and his evolution theory. Uh, they, uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of people don't understand the racism that is behind that theory. Also, God doesn't segregate ages like the socialist school system or the apostate emergent churches do, where they uh, have a different Sunday school and different uh, church services, we don't have services, we have meetings. We meet together to, uh, to praise and, and to glorify our Lord. We don't have services that are offered like a business. Instead, these emergent churches do. They have uh, their, uh, and they segregate the, the groups, the age groups, you know, and, and I was in the college and career class, and before that I was in the youth group, and I asked the pastor if I could get out of the youth group because it was so, it was so aggravating being in there. Uh, how uh, wishy-washy it was and how everybody in the youth group didn't care about the things of God and, and I just had no pleasure being in there and I, I loved it being in the, in the young adults class, uh, the young marrieds class. I loved the, the Sunday school teacher there and taught some of the, the, the meat of the word of God and I wanted to be there instead of in the youth group and the pastor. I asked the pastor specifically if I could please go into that Sunday school class. And he said, no, the Lord has a place for you here in this youth group, and, and you should be in there and try to be an, a good influence on them. And so I tried, but it was an aggravation. Uh, and so we don't do what those churches do, uh, where they segregate the, the different age groups. Uh, we also, uh, when we should understand, so regarding the Word of God, that uh, when it addresses the father, there's still something for the mother and the children. When it addresses the mother, there's still something there for the father and the children. And when it addresses the children, that's not the time and opportunity for the parents to turn off their ears and to stop listening. Uh, there's still something there for the father and mother. Now, just because God addresses one kind of person doesn't mean that the other kinds of people don't need to listen and learn uh, even if they have a different gender, if they're, uh, they are in, in a different location, if they're in a different time period in which they live, if they live in a different society than the original society the Bible was written in, uh, if they're in different, uh, under a different government type, or if they have different degrees of freedom, or if they have a different station in life, or if they have a different financial position, or if they have a different job than what is described in that passage, 
the, that passage still applies to them in some way or to their church. There is a reason why God has preserved that phrase uh, for us today. And so it's for us. It's not for somebody else. We need to apply it to ourselves uh, and find out the application for ourselves. There's, of course, only one interpretation of the Bible, and that's God's interpretation. It's not open to many different interpretations or to somebody's private interpretation. You know, instead, we, we should be looking for the application of that passage to ourselves. The goal of the Christian isn't to come up with some new private doctrine or interpretation, uh, but his goal should be to understand what God's interpretation is of that passage and then find how it applies to the Christian, to ourselves. Not to somebody else, but to myself. <clears throat> so I wanted to point that out about, that pa about this passage, that it still has application for all of us. Even though it's talking about the wife, the husbands still need to listen. Even though it's talking to the husbands, the wives still need to listen. And the children still need to listen. We saw in verse 21 uh, that the husband should have the fear of God. That, that phrase is not just for the church in general. That phrase is there for the following paragraph, referring to the relationship of the husband and wife, to the relationship of the children and their parents, and to the relationship of the masters and with the servants. That in all these relationships on both sides, there should be the fear of God. And we talked last week about the husband should have the fear of God. We saw in verses 22 through 20 and 24 that the wife is commanded to submit to the husband, not that the husband is commanded to force his wife to submit to him, or to, uh, that he is to command or to force his wife to submit to him. We also saw in verse 23 that the husband is commanded to be the head of his home, and we talked about the importance of him being the head of his home even when the wife doesn't want him to be the head of the home. We saw in verse 23 that the husband is expected to prioritize his concern to keep his family safe, including that uh, biblical doctrine of being the coverture of his family. We saw in verses 22 and 24 also that the husband is expected to exemplify Christ's care and headship of the church in his treatment of his wife. That, that's the whole point of the passage, is to compare the husband and wife's relationship to the relationship of Christ with his church. We then studied verse 25 uh, last week, wherein we saw that the husband is also commanded to love his wife. So the idea of the husband loving his wife didn't, uh, wasn't the first point for the husband in verse 25. It, the verses before applied to him also. We, in that verse, defined what agape love is. And I normally don't use the, Hebrew, the Greek or Hebrew terms, but I think it's good to understand uh, the different terms behind the word love because it helps us to, to identify or differentiate the different kinds of love. And we talked about the two main ones, uh, which are agape and phileo love, uh, that one is more of based on feelings, the other one is more based on uh, decision or the will, uh, on a conscious decision, on devotion, uh, as opposed to the feelings and the whim. Uh, and so... We defined what love is there, and we saw that love is more than a feeling, uh, that it's a sacrificial, uh, selfless devotion to that person or that thing or that idea. And we saw that how a husband's agape love for his wife and his family will promote his purity. It will promote his devotion to his wife and to his family, and it will promote his commitment to his family if he has biblical love for his family. And we saw how the extent and pattern of Christ's love for the church exemplifies the love that the husband should have for his wife. We saw that correlation there. Today, we're going to be studying verses 26 through 27, where the husband's love is compared further to Christ's love for the church. <clears throat> and so let's go ahead and Turn there to Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So the first thing that I want to do as we delve into this passage is to qualify 
what Christ is referring to as the church. This is a controversial subject. Uh, even in our church, we've gone back and forth about this. Uh, the Christian has to be cautious not to take parables or types or similes too far. Okay, we've got to understand the difference between these things because they're all throughout the Word of God, and these are the times when we can uh, go without re reading the Bible uh, literally. Uh, so we have to be able to differentiate these three types of uh, phrases or, or ideas in the Bible with what we should be taking literally. Uh, there is an important rule with parables and types and similes. Uh, and that rule is that you can't read further into them than their main point. Okay, this is, <laughs> this is vital when you're reading the Word of God that you don't read into a parable or a type, like we have the sacrifices being a type of Christ, or when we have uh, similes, like when something is said to be like something or as something, or metaphors, when something is said to be something that obviously it's not. Uh, we're going to be looking at one of those metaphors, uh, that you can't read further into them than their main point. Uh, this prevents the Christian from adopting many heresies that we see in Christianity today, or pseudo-Christianity, like the Catholic cult. We have purgatory. That's pretty much a doctrine created besides from uh, pseudo-apocryphal books. I think apocryphal books, I should say. Uh, and you have Baptist purgatory. That's taken from uh, all these, uh, these parables and, uh, or the misuse or misapplication of these parables. Or I should say misunderstanding. And we also have transubstantiation, which is the, the Catholic doctrine, or consubstantiation, they say that either uh, the, the cookie or, or the wine turns into the, the body and blood of Christ uh, when you eat it, or that, that it is when it's blessed, or that it is when you eat it. It doesn't matter. And either way, it doesn't turn into the body of Christ or uh, the blood of Christ. It's a symbol. It's a picture. It's a type. It's not uh, something to be taken literally. And that's why... Uh, we need to not be that we need to be careful not to take parables, types, and similes too far. Uh, for example, in Luke chapter 18, verses 2 through 8, Christ likens himself to a judge, the importunate widow, widow we think of, uh, who uh, had an injustice done to her, and so she goes to the judge to get him to act on her behalf, to give her justice. In that parable, the judge is referred to as one who doesn't fear God. Uh, he is referred to as one who doesn't regard men, referring to him not caring. This isn't just the idea of God who doesn't regard men, not being a respecter of persons. The idea here of him not regarding men is the idea of him not caring about the people over which he's presiding. Uh, we also see that he's described as somebody who is wearied by the request for justice. Would God be wearied by the request for, the justice, uh, for justice from his saints? Of course not. We also see, finally, that that judge is specifically referred to as an unjust judge. Okay? Yet this judge is referred to by Christ as a, 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 as a, a simile of Christ himself. This doesn't mean that the details of this parable actually relate to Christ, that this judge really is a representation of Christ. No, he's just using a main point of that parable, that we should come before our God to pray on a regular basis, even when we don't see the answer to our prayer. And in the same way, you can't read further into the simile in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, uh, where we see Christ's relationship with the church being likened as a simile to the relationship of the husband with the wife. Another example that kind of helps us understand the idea of the church here, is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. We see the seven churches being likened to what? What are the seven churches likened to that are around Christ and this vision of, John, of, of, uh, of the Apostle John? What is he likened to? What is he likened uh, these candlesticks? I'm sorry, I said the churches, to the candlesticks. I forgot which one I used. If it's the candlesticks to the church or the church. Anyway... The candlesticks are uh, representations or similes of the church. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars 
are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So we have that simile uh, explained there. Uh, this doesn't mean that we should read into this further. This doesn't mean that if you touch one of the churches, you're going to get burned, okay, because the church is likened to a candlestick. This doesn't mean that if you apply the water of the word of God to the candlestick of the church, that the church is going to die out, okay? That's, that's not the point of the passage. You can't read That's pretty I thought that was funny. Uh, this doesn't mean that the fire of the candlestick is likened to the Holy Spirit. Some would say that, you know, hey, this is the fire of the, of the candlestick is the Holy Spirit. This doesn't mean that the wax of the candle is likened to the souls of dead saints that have burned out. Uh, and this doesn't mean that the length of the seven candlesticks is likened to the lifespan of, the, of each of the churches. You can read all kinds of stuff into the Word of God, which a lot of these cults do. Uh, however, from this passage, one does draw from uh, this phrase that the, the seven churches are treated separately, not as one universal church. Uh, because it's before, I would say, this the idea of him sending the letters to the seven churches. These are seven literal uh, uh, local churches that uh, John is told to write down these letters uh, to address to, and they were to be sent to these seven local churches. And uh, they were local churches be because it wasn't the time of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Or we're going to get into that uh, qualification soon. And so just because Christ's local church is likened to a man's wife uh, doesn't mean that all aspects of marriage apply to the church. Okay, that doesn't mean that you can sit here and take all the aspects of our marriage that we understand from the Word of God uh, or from our own understanding and apply them to Christ's relationship with the church. This also doesn't mean that Christ is a polygamist, uh, that you can read that into this passage because he has many church brides. That's not his point. Uh, if you could, turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. Go ahead and leave your finger there in Ephesians chapter 5. And let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. <clears throat> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. And we're turning to Jeremiah chapter 3. I really need to get a better Bible to do this with. Jeremiah chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verse, starting in verse 6. And we see here that a metaphor is being used. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up, now he likens him to a woman, she is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harley. He's talking here, talking about uh, spiritual harlotry or idolatry. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she turned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all these causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away. So now here it's talking about the idea of marital divorce, of being put away, and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also, because Israel and Judah are two separate women, uh, and both married to, uh, here in this metaphor, to the Lord. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Talking about using uh, stones and, and wood to make uh, idols. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. Now he likens them to children, which is interesting. For I am married unto you. 
here referring to him being married to children. And I will take you, one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. There he's talking about the remnant that he'll take out of a treacherous Israel. And so God here, as a metaphor, likens his relationship with northern Israel and southern Judah as a husband's sister's sister wives. And this doesn't mean that God is here condoning or encouraging polygamy. That's not the point. Uh, God is simply using a real-life example that illustrates his point well. He's not saying that he condones this relationship or this kind of action uh, for a wife to do this to her husband or for a husband to have uh, to be polygamist or to have sister wives. Uh, he's not condoning that. He's just using that as an example. And when God then likens them to children to whom he's married, that doesn't mean that you can go and uh, force into this illustration that now he's married the children of his wives. Okay, that's not the point. Uh, the point is just to take it as a metaphor uh, that God is using an illustration. And so also, we see throughout the Word of God, and we're done in that passage, you turn back to Ephesians chapter 5, the church is also likened to a body, a body, a physical human body. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23 says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So there the church is likened to the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. We're here talking about that same body, the church. Uh, this doesn't mean uh, that there are bodies within the body. Uh, some would say, as far as the universal church, that there are bodies within the body. God never provides an explanation of how there are physical bodies within a spiritual body. Uh, nor does God provide any explanation of how a body can represent a universal church, which is very difficult for somebody to imagine. Whenever the body is used to illustrate the church, it's clearly referring to a local body with physical members who are assembled and work together. That's the point of the illustration of a body, that their members are to work together and be together to make up that body of which Christ is the head. In the same way, whenever the word church is used in relation to the present time, I believe it applies to a local assembly. Of course, the word body has, does, and will refer to other things. And the word church uh, will refer to something else in the future. Uh, but we're referring to its use today. Uh, a church simply put, is a real-life, tangible, physical place where the saints physically meet together to meet with God. That is the church. That it is an assembly. Uh, simply and clearly put, a church is an assembly, and it's only an assembly. That is the definition of a church. It can refer to the act of assembling. It could refer to a group of believers assembling or gathering or congregating, that's what the, the Old Testament refers to, the, the, the church of Israel congregating a lot at the uh, tabernacle of congregation. And that was their church. That was where the people met together physically to meet with their God. Or it could refer to a group of people themselves, not just to the, to the meeting, but also to the people who make up that church, uh, who assemble, who gather to congregate, to meet with their God. That's the point of a church, is for the people to meet together to meet with God. I don't believe there's any other definition uh, of a biblical church in the Word of God that we, should, that we can draw from. What the church is has changed throughout time. Uh, before the Mosaic Law, there, the people gathered more together like clans. We had the more, more of the idea of the family. And we had the father, or the, uh, it was more a patriarch, sorry. It was a, the patriarchal sense uh, where the father was the one who represented the people and taught the people and did the sacrifices for the people. And they met at altars. And the families and the societies uh, physically met together at that altar. Uh, there, at that time, there was no universal or mystical or ethereal church in which they met with their God. In the Old Testament, under the Mosaic Law, uh, God used the terms wife and church. 
several times. We see throughout the Old Testament that God referred to Israel as his wife or his church. Uh, to refer to the Jews in, and to the places in which they met with God. Uh, when the Jews met with God, for instance, at Mount Sinai, the only time where we see the word church in relation to the Old Testament is in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7, verse 38, where Israel met with God at Mount Sinai. That was a church. Uh, he says, it says here in Acts chapter 7, verses thir verse 38, he says, this is he which was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So he's there referring to Exodus chapter 20 when Israel came to meet with God at Mount Sinai. That was a church. In Exodus chapter 19, right before the Israelites met with God at Mount Sinai, God gave Moses instructions to give to the Israelites to tell them how to prepare to physically meet with their God and uh, what to do when they approached the mountain to have church. That was their church. That was where they met physically and met with their God. Uh, they were called there his church because that was a real tangible body of saints in that nation. And that was where the saints were to physically gather together to meet with their God. Uh, during the time of the tabernacle and the temple in Israel, it was called the tabernacle of congregation. It was where the people congregated physically to meet with God. Uh, during the Old Testament, uh, there was no universal church or Catholic church because the people didn't meet together in any uh, mystical way. They met physically with God at the prescribed place. Uh, that church in Israel, later on, apostatized. They were pretty much apostate, most of the, the, the history of Israel. And uh, that church of Israel ceased at the end of uh, the Old Testament. And that it was replaced with the New Testament churches. Uh, and uh, that church apostatized, just like many churches today, we see apostatizing. In the New Testament... The physical church of Israel, as it was implemented by God and understood, was ended. And the physical Old Testament church was replaced by the physical churches throughout the world. Uh, today, all the local churches physically meet together in a similar way as they did in the Old Testament, when they met at the Tabernacle of Congregation, or when they met with God at Mount Sinai. Today, in the New Testament, there are no mystical or ethereal meeting places in which the saints can spiritually gather together to meet with their God. Understand the definition of a church. All these churches are real, tangible bodies of saints, having real, tangible, physical meeting places to meet with their God. And then there's the future. So that's the present day. And then in the future, when all the saints are going to be in heaven, there will be one final real church. We're all going to be meeting together in one place uh, to meet with our God. Uh, there will be one real tangible body of saints having one real tangible physical meeting place to meet with God in heaven or in the New Jerusalem. Uh, that church will replace the present day churches as that final meeting place for the saints with their God. And so when a husband is told to follow the pattern and the extent of Christ's death for the church, he isn't told to take his mind to an intangible, mystical body of, of all the saints throughout history uh, for him to compare his relationship to. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, Paul is speaking to real husbands uh, who are the members of a real local church. Uh, the church spoken of here is a called-out assembly of these Ephesian believers. He's here talking to the Ephesian church in this Ephesian epistle. Uh, who physically met in a tangible place in Ephesus with each other and with God. And I want to emphasize that point, that um, a church, you can't have a church without an assembly, without a meeting place of everybody together. Uh, we who meet in another church in another time and place, like today in the last day of 2017 in Ocala, Florida, uh, we can still relate to this epistle and passage not because it's uh, referring to a universal church, but because we also are a church, a local church, 
made up of husbands and wives and children. So this still applies to us. God's word is living. It's timeless. It's omnipotent. It's omnipresent. And it's able to apply to all churches everywhere at the same time. It applies to all of us everywhere. And so Christ dying for each of the people in that husband's church, because here he's talking to the husband and how he should liken his relationship to the church. Uh, when Christ uh, refers to his act of dying and loving, dying for and loving the church, uh, he is telling the, that husband in that church uh, to relate it to his church, uh, that it still has a practical application for his church and uh, not just for that man. Uh, every member of that local church is expected to work together as a unit, as a body, to exemplify verse 27. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. That is to be the goal of our local church, to be glorious. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it, our church, should be holy and without blemish. That's Christ's intention for our local church. And so that man is also not told that this is the purpose with which a diocese or a network or a partnership or an area, area manager of multiple churches is to be concerned. This is the concern of the local church, not of uh, the, the convention of a bunch of Baptist churches. Uh, this is the concern of each autonomous church. Uh, each local church is to be autonomous. And so... Here in verses 25 through 27, we're done with that point about the church. In verses 25 through 27, Paul is making an important statement here. Uh, let's go ahead and read it again, starting in verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. That's the purpose that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That Paul is here making an important statement in this verse, in this passage, that Christ didn't save the church just to save the church. And that God didn't save the Christian just to save the Christian. Uh, God doesn't just expect also the husband to marry his wife just to be married to his wife. God didn't institute marriage just so that men and women can have a status, a social status called being married, uh, not just so that they can have companionship so that they can spend the rest of their lives together, and not just so that they can have posterity, that they can have children. Uh, that's not the purpose of marriage. Uh, it is the purpose of marriage if you don't have Christ as your Lord and Savior and you believe in evolution, uh, that that's the purpose of their lives, is just to have children, or one or two, not more, because then it's bad for the environment. And, uh, you know, it's better for us to kill the babies than the trees. And, and so they, all they care about is uh, have, passing off their posterity to their next generation, and that's the point of their lives. What a sad existence with no purpose. But God has a purpose for the marriage. Uh, first off, I want us to talk about the church, that Christ saved the church so that it will glorify him. Uh, the purpose of Christ's love and his acts of love is not ultimately for the Christian. It doesn't end. The purpose is not just for the Christian. The purpose of mankind's creation, of the purpose of God's love of mankind, the purpose of mankind's salvation, and the purpose of our Lord's continued care for the church is to cause us to better glorify and to praise him. That's the end all of the Christian. Not just to save him, but for him to praise and glorify the one who has given him his life and his salvation, his second life. And so there is no higher calling for any creation or for any person or for any marriage than the glorification of our Lord. A person who thinks that God created him and was merciful toward him and empowers him just to have fellowship with God or just to live his life his own way is ignorant of the Bible and of the most important foundational purpose of his life, which is the glorification of God. A person who thinks that he is innately special 
uh, to God, or that he's worthy of what God has given to him and done, done for him, or that that person is able to live without constantly glorifying his Lord. That person is mistaken. Uh, he's either not saved or he's backslidden because he's selfish. Uh, he's either ignorant of God's word and, or ignorant of, his, of God's will for his life. And that person who thinks that he can live his life for himself is unworthy of Christ. At salvation, the Christian is crucified to the world with Christ and he's expected to live as Christ, not however he wants. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, it says, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. There, there when he says he's crucified with Christ, he's crucified to the world, to not be able to do what he used to do, but to do what Christ wants him to do, his new Lord. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We have a great motivational factor here for the Christian to live for Christ, because he loved us and gave himself for us. We have that similar idea here in Ephesians chapter 5. Also at salvation, the Christian belongs to his new Lord. In Romans chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, he says, For none of us liveth to himself. And no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. You don't belong to yourself. You're not your own for you to live your life your own way. You're the Lord's. You belong to him. For to this end, for this purpose, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. Also at salvation, the Christian is expected not to live for himself, but for him who died for him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, he says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, not living for yourself to live your life your own way and to please and glorify yourself, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Also at salvation, the Christian's body is purchased and owned by the Holy Spirit. And in his body, he's expected to glorify his Lord, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Also, the person who doesn't take up his cross and follow Christ is not saved and is not worthy of Christ. This is an interesting idea. A lot of people don't understand that to make Christ uh, your Savior, he has to be your Lord. And you have to take up your cross and follow him. Matthew chapter 10 Verses 37 through 39, he says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And so for us to be worthy of Christ, we have to forsake this world, forsake ourselves, forsake our own agendas, and glorify and serve our new Lord. If there's a person in this church who thinks that the whole church's glorification of our Lord is not his concern and duty, he is also mistaken. It's also a matter not just of ourselves glorifying our Lord, but also our church. We are responsible for our church. God didn't place every Christian in the church for any Christian to remain a recluse. We're all to participate and have fellowship with one another and to do more than just participate and have fellowship. Uh, the, God didn't place the Christian in the church, in this local church, to live his life apart from the care of the other members of the church. He should be cared. He should care for the other members of the church. God also didn't put the Christian in the church uh, to serve himself, but to serve the church and to serve the other members of the church. Christ also didn't put the Christian in the church to live without the fellowship and exhortation of the other members of the church, or to not contribute to the edification and the purity and the holiness of his church. That's the purpose of the Christian, to contribute to his church. Every Christian in the church is responsible to actively contribute to his church's glorification of their Lord as much as possible. And so in the same way that Christ's purpose for his love and salvation of the church is for the church to bring glory to him, 
so also he expects the husband and wife's marriage relationship to bring glory to him. Uh, the husband's family must not be a hindrance or a burden preventing him from glorifying his God. Uh, God has given the husband a wife and a family to help him to glorify God and for that husband to help his family to glorify God. The most important purpose and function of the husband is to bring his family closer to our Lord and to cause them to glorify our Lord more. That's the purpose of our family. The husband must work to make his wife and his children better helpers to serve and glorify God. Uh, he has to help his wife to have the right mentality and the right priorities uh, so that he can help her to glorify God more. And in order for him to help his wife to have the right mentality and the right priorities, the husband himself has to have the right mentality and priorities when he's dealing with his wife and when he's dealing with his circumstances. The husband has to also communicate with his wife the Lord's purpose for her to glorify her Lord and the cares and the goals that he and his Lord have for her. That's the husband's uh, duty. That's the husband's uh, function in the marriage, is to do what he can to help his wife uh, honor and glorify her Lord. The husband must also understand his wife. He has to nurture his wife, and he has to honor his wife, and he has to handle her delicately in order to help her to glorify God more. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, he says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The husband has to be careful how he talks to his wife, how he treats his wife so that he can help her to glorify God more. Uh, even if his intentions are good and right, uh, how the husband talks to his wife and treats her is important. It's not just the words, it's also how the words are said. It's not just in the words, it's also in the actions. The husband has to show that he cares for her and that his intentions are right. The husband can't just be task-oriented when he's dealing with his wife. A lot of us men, we're task-oriented, especially me. I manage a pawn shop, and I'm used to telling guys all day long what to do and how to, how to do it. But the husband instead has to talk to his wife with genuine love, with genuine meekness, with genuine affection, and with concern for her and the family. The husband has to make sure that his wife doesn't have any legitimate reasons to doubt his intentions, like being hypocritical or being selfish or, or lying. Uh, the husband shouldn't have, the wife shouldn't have any reason to doubt her husband's intentions. The husband has to focus on how he can lead his wife, how he can encourage her to do what is right without coming across as controlling or demanding. And that's difficult, but as a head, it can be done. That is the husband's function. The husband also ha cannot lose sight of God's greatest intent for his marriage. Uh, that all of the family's lifestyle, their activities, their conversations should all be used as occasions in which they can glorify God, both in the home and outside the home. The husband can't just plan one occasion each month or one occasion each week for him to go out and glorify God, thinking that he's now met his quota, and to think that the rest of the time he can put his call to glorify his God on the shelf. Our families need to stop thinking about and focusing on and being preoccupied with the cares and the concerns and the distractions of this life and instead make the cares of Christ uh, the driving factor of everything in our lives. <clears throat> All the ideas and aspirations that we have for ourselves and for our families to do and to accomplish need to be seen from God's perspective and from the perspective of eternity, not what we must do here and now. If God's will and God's glory don't fit into your plans this week, we must remove the plans and make plans that can give us opportunity to obey and glorify God. You understand the difference between living lives uh, throughout the week as we see that it comes up in the week and, and based on the circumstances, we need to set that aside and instead focus on what our Lord wants us to do this week and how we can glorify God in what we do this week. Instead of planning and doing what we want to do or what we need to do, we need to think about how we can glorify God in our plans 
and in what we want to do and in what we need to do. <clears throat> if we have to go to work, we should think about how we can glorify God at work. If we have to go to the store, we should think about how we can glorify God at the store. If we have to go to, if we're going, we want to go to the park or to, uh, you know, the springs or whatever, we need to think about how we can glorify God at the park. If we're stuck in the house, we have to think about how we can glorify God in the house. Uh, everything in our lives at all times should be about how we can glorify God in doing so. God's not going to bless us for having the most loving and the most fun home. God's not going to bless us for having the cleanest home. God's not going to bless us for having the most strict home or the most well-behaved children. God's not going to bless us for having the sweetest relationship with our wives. God's not going to bless us for having the most safe and secure house. Although these, although these things are good, they pale in comparison with having a home that obeys God, that serves God, that praises God, and that ultimately glorifies God at all times. That's what pleases God. And so the question is, how often uh, has the thought of how you've glorified God with your wife and your family entered your mind this week? How often have you thought throughout the day that you're glorifying God or how you're going to glorify God and serve God? Uh, think about now all the ways in which you've glorified God in this past week. Uh, can you count on one hand uh, how many times or how many minutes that you've spent glorifying your God? Uh, we have to fulfill our calling and our roles as family members and as church members by prioritizing the glorification of our Lord at all times throughout the week. Not uh, sectioning it off, not compartmentalizing it, but always focusing on glorifying our God. And so that was the, the lesson today, uh, the first hour lesson. And next lesson we're going to get into some ways uh, in which the husband is expected to love his wife. Uh, how he can help his wife to better glorify God. And so uh, we're continuing our study here through Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 through 27. Uh, I won't do a full review because uh, of, uh, I don't want to bore you guys with a review, but last hour we uh, looked at some of the aspects of Christ being, Christ's relationship with the church being compared to the husband and his wife, and we saw that correlation, and we saw the most important aspect of that correlation is the purpose of Christ's uh, death for the church and Christ's love of the church is for the church to glorify him. It's not an end all just to save the church for the church to be saved. It's saved so that it can glorify its Lord. And so now we're going to see some ways in which our Lord intends for the church to glorify himself and for the wife to glorify her Lord uh, with the help of her husband. <clears throat> and so first I want us to notice here that the Lord's intent is to prepare the church to glorify him when it is presented to himself. Uh, in verse 27 he says that he might present it to himself a glorious church. He doesn't just say that the church is to, that he loves and he died for the church uh, for the church to glorify himself, he said that the church is saved so that it can be presented to himself later on as a glorious church. <clears throat> and I believe that the, this presentation of the church to its Lord is a reference to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So now we're getting into that idea that I introduced first hour. Uh, that this seems most likely because it's during the resurrection of the saints at the time of the marriage supper of the Lamb when all believers of all time are brought together to dwell with Christ, uh, whether that's in heaven or in earth, uh, during the millennial reign. So we're talking here after the Antichrist is destroyed and all, the, uh, all, of, his, uh, all of his armies are destroyed and, and the world is brought under submission to Christ, but then begins the, uh, the millennial reign. And first off, uh, we have the, uh, the resurrection of the saints, and we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, he says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made ready herself, made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. 
They're talking about the holiness of the saints, referring to the saints who have all uh, been resurrected. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, so during the millennial reign, there will be no more churches meeting separately with Christ, but instead all saints will meet together with Christ at once. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, he says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Uh, there I believe referring to uh, Mount Sinai particularly, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. They're talking about, hey, let's go have church. To the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. Hey, that's what's going on right now. We're having teaching and church. And we will walk in his paths. For out of, the, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we have there a, a picture of what's going to be like uh, when all the saints are gathered together with the Lord in heaven and we all get to meet together to praise and worship and uh, to hear from our Lord. So I believe this phrase refers to the Lord working in the hearts and the lives of all the members of the local church until the marriage supper of the Lamb, when the church of all saints in its entirety assembles to meet with its Lord. Uh, it appears that Paul has the same event in mind when he mentions his same intent as our Lord here, when he speaks of a time in which he is, will also present the Corinthian churches to Christ, the Corinthian church to Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 3, Paul says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So there he's talking to the Corinthian church, saying that he has espoused them to Christ. Well, what is his purpose? Not to end at espousal, uh, to become a spouse. Uh, there was a purpose for it. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. There we see that same word, presentation, that I may present you to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtleties, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's uh, there warning them of uh, their doctrinal error. And it appears that Paul also referred to this event and to this time period in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, when he says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. Well, when does this presentation happen? When will the church and uh, Paul himself be presented uh, to Christ? And that, I believe, is at the marriage supper of the Lamb, when, uh, the bride, uh, when we have uh, the bride being presented to Christ. Uh, Christ is preparing now the local church to be presented to himself. That's, I believe, the point here in Ephesians chapter 5. Christ is working on the church to be pure, to be clean, and uh, to be sanctified, so that when the marriage supper of the Lamb comes, the church will be the most ready that it can be to give him the most praise and glory that it can at that time, when that time comes. I believe that the preparation of the Ephesian church for this event is what Paul had in mind in chapter 3, verse 21, when he says, Unto him be glory in the church. I believe he's here referring to the local church. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And that idea is that they'll have Christ being glorified in their church now until they are uh, assembled to uh, join that, marriage, that, that, uh, that universal church in heaven uh, at that time. And so we should be living in light of our Lord's preparation of us and our church for this future event. We have to live in light of it now. It's not just something that we should expect to happen later on. We all understand that the sanctification of the Christian is an ongoing process. And then if we decide, I don't want to be sanctified right now, and I want to live like the world and, and be carnal, uh, that Christian is going to have the chastisement of his Lord upon him. Uh, and that Christian is going to have a miserable life, 
And uh, when, in knowing what his Lord expects for him to do, having the conviction of the Holy Spirit, having the chastisement of his Father upon him, and it's better for that Christian to instead say, hey, the Lord is working on me to sanctify me for the future, to prepare me for heaven. I should go ahead and submit to that now. Uh, Christ will be the end all of our local church. Uh, and he will be the one in the end that we will care the most about to impress and to glorify and to please. And so he might as well be the end all of each and every one of us in our lives and in our families and in our church now. Uh, the Lord's preparation of the church to be presented to himself is also a picture of the husband's relationship with the wife. The husband's purpose in the marriage is not to have his wife for himself. Uh, the purpose of the marriage relationship is not to have the wife, the, for the husband to have the wife, to be the best that she can be for himself. It's not about the husband. Uh, the purpose for the husband's management the husband's care, the husband's coverture of his family is not to just have them to, uh, to serve and to do the will of the husband, but to glorify our Lord the most that they can now. That is the purpose of the family. The husband's purpose for his family is to have them be the best prepared that they can be to glorify our Lord until they die and they take up their place in that heavenly congregation and until they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, because we are responsible for our families and to prepare them for that time. The biblical husband doesn't just have this present life in view, uh, but he has eternity in view. He has eternity in his mind. Uh, he wants to lay up treasures there, not on this earth. The husband must have the end game in mind the whole time to prepare his wife and his children to have the most eternal rewards, to have uh, God be the greatest, uh, to glorify God the greatest uh, as possible, and to be ready to, uh, uh, to be as ready as possible for the judgment seat of Christ. That is the husband's purpose. Christ's purpose is also to sanctify and to cleanse the church, to prepare it to glorify him. Uh, our Lord's tool for sanctifying and cleansing the church as we see here in the text, is the Word of God. Uh, cleansing here uh, carries the idea of removing spiritual and moral filth. It comes uh, from the idea of the Old Testament practice of the priest bathing or the offerer cleaning his animal uh, before offering his animal at the temple. Uh, sanctifying uh, refers to the Old Testament ceremonial process of making something holy that was unholy. Okay, that's simply what sanctification is. Making something that was unholy, holy. Uh, sanctification of the saint under the Mosaic law occurred when that saint repented of his sin or his transgression of God's law, and he sought to be right with God, so he sought God's fellowship at the temple. Uh, where, and so he went to where God was at the temple, asking God for forgiveness in the prescribed fashion by sacrifice. That's how a saint in the Old Testament was sanctified, how he was able to have a relationship with Christ. Not for salvation, but to have a relationship with God. Sometimes when a transgressor of the Mosaic Law was made unclean by touching something that was unclean, or by having a disease that made them unclean, they had to be separated from what made them unclean, and then they had to bathe themselves and wash their clothes, and then they had to go to the temple to ask for forgiveness uh, in God's prescribed fashion by sacrifice. That was God's way back then. Uh, one significant reason for the Mosaic Law was to sanctify the Israelites, to set them apart from the world that he, he called them out of uh, to be his saints, to be his people. And so God's method of sanctifying them was to set them apart from the wicked nations around them in order to use them to obey them, I'm sorry, for them to obey him, uh, for them to serve him, and for them to praise him, and to glorify him. That was the purpose of God's sanctification of Israel. And so, making laws simply for the purpose of sanctification and separation gives us an explanation for some of those Old Testament laws that seem arbitrary, or that don't seem to us to have a good explanation. 
some of those laws, like you can't mix your, your clothing or it can't uh, eat uh, items, uh, eat food that uh, was considered unclean. Uh, some of these things we don't necessarily understand why God uh, made these laws. Well, a lot of the laws, were, or some of the laws, were just made to sanctify the people, to, to show that they were different. And uh, there are several passages relating to that. I should have, uh, record, I should have uh, had one to, to read to you. Uh, sanctification also relates to sanctifying something by performing the ceremonial practices that the Mosaic Law provides in order to make something or someone holy. And we're going to get into that idea further in a little bit. The Christian today, though, doesn't have to be physically cleansed and to obey the Old Testament ceremonial practices. And aren't we thankful for that? That we don't have to go to some temple in Israel. Instead, we can come right here in a, into a, lo a local church. And we don't have to uproot and move to Israel. Uh, we can now uh, fellowship with God here in the church as a group. And so now, today, the best way to remove sin and moral uncleanness and worldly compromise and doctrinal heresy from the person, from the individual, from the Christian, is with the Word of God. The Word of God is what cleanses and sanctifies. The Old Testament ceremonial practices, where they had to wash themselves in their clothes, typified the sin and transgression being removed and the person being sanctified by the washing of the, word, of the, of the water by the Word. Uh, so we have that typified in the Old Testament of what we see today in this passage. God's word is what spiritually, morally, and practically cleanses the Christian in God's eyes now. That's what the Christian needs. Not to go to the temple and to sacrifice, uh, not to see a priest, as the Catholics still try to get us to do, uh, but to uh, simply uh, Im immerse ourselves in the word of God. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 20, uh, Jesus clarified that eating with unwashed hands... Uh, doesn't spiritually defile the person. Remember the, the, the time when the Pharisees said that his disciples weren't washing their hands before they ate? And Jesus said, it's not what, a man, uh, it's not what uh, the man eats, it's what comes from the man. Uh, some purport that we are still obligated to the Mosaic law, except the ceremonial laws. They try to split the law into the three different laws, the ceremonial law and the, the moral law and the and the civil law, and those people have no grounds for chopping up God's law into these three unrealistic categories. Uh, these people have no biblical grounds to believe that they're obligated to any of the Mosaic law. We're not under the old covenant. We're not under its law. We are under the new covenant and its law. Uh, their system is contradicted when Christ states that the New Testament believer isn't obligated to the other parts of the law, that they're still that they say are still in effect, uh, like eating with unwashed hands. It's not a ceremonial law. I don't believe it is. I don't see how you can see it as a ceremonial law because it has nothing to do with the temple or with the sacrifices or with the priests. It's just washing your hands before you eat. I would consider that a moral law uh, if you had to classify it as one of those three laws. Uh, there are many other practices that aren't classified under ceremonial law that the Christian today still doesn't need to obey under the new covenant, like eating unclean animals or trimming the corner of his beard or wearing tassels on the border of his garments, and he has to have a border of his garments. Uh, so now the Christian is cleansed not by these physical or ceremonial practices, but by hearing and living by God's word. And so the best way for the Christian to be sanctified and cleansed is by hearing God's word, by listening to godly exhortation, to listening to repro reproof, and listening to counsel. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, we already studied this passage. It says, But speaking the truth in love to one another may grow up into him in all things as a church, uh, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body of the church fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, which are all the members of the church, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, that every, every one of us as, as a part of the body should be effectually working together for the purpose, as he says, making increase 
of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so we see there that we need to listen to one another, to exhortation, reproof, and, and counsel. But also, the Christian uh, will be sanctified and cleansed by hearing the Word of God, by reading and listening and understanding and applying God's Word to his life. And we talked about this when we studied Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 21, when he says, But ye have not so learned Christ, but, be, but if, I'm sorry, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. And so there we understand, we need to have the word of God in our lives, the truth of God's word, uh, to change us, to, to not just hear it, but to, be, to understand it and to apply it to our lives. And so the best way for the church, so we saw that's the best way for the Christian to be cleansed and to be uh, sanctified, but also for the church to be sanctified and cleansed, is by hearing the word of God. If we want a church that's spiritually and morally clean and that is sanctified from the world for the use of our Lord, we have to ground ourselves individually and as a family and as a church, ground ourselves in the Word of God and to focus on it and to emphasize it and to stand up for it uh, in as much opportunity as we can. Uh, it's only the Word of God that's going to remove the wickedness from the individuals in our church, and thus from the church. It has to happen to the individual for it to happen to the church. It's not about sharing opinions and socializing, but about giving each other biblical exhortation. Uh, it's not about preaching feel-good uh, sermons or motivating sermons, uh, but by preaching the Bible. It's not about providing fun and entertainment in the church, but by teaching biblical truth. It's only the word of God that can sanctify and cleanse our church and its members and to make our church glorify God more. That is the purpose of our church. Also, we see here that the best way for the wife to be sanctified and cleansed is by providing her with the word of God, particularly for the husband to provide it to his wife. The best way for the husband to cause his wife to be more godly and holy, to be a better help, and to be a better mother, is to saturate her in the word of God. That's what he's here saying. The husband has to prioritize the spiritual purity and the holiness of his wife. If the husband's purpose in his marriage is to cause his wife to bring God the most glory and to have her as prepared as possible to be presented to the Lord, he must use the most effective tool available to him to accomplish these goals. And that tool is not himself. It's not his ideas. It's not a psychiatrist. It's the word of God. The husband must encourage his wife to have a personal relationship with God, both in reading God's word and in prayer. If the husband isn't aware of his wife's personal relationship with God, or he thinks that his wife's personal relationship with God is poor, it's an indication that he's not fulfilling his function as her head and keeping her spiritually safe. If the husband is, isn't working to encourage his wife to read the Bible more and isn't reading the Bible with his family, this is convicting <laughs> for me to be doing this more, uh, and he's not reading the Bible with his family, it's an indication that he's not fulfilling his function to sanctify and to cleanse his family, to help them to glorify their Lord more. <clears throat> and then finally, if the wife seems worldly or carnal or compromising or spiritually weak, and the husband isn't actively working on saturating her with the Word of God and with righteousness, it's an indication that the husband is not fulfilling his function to sanctify and to cleanse his wife. I'm not saying that the husband is responsible for his wife's free will, or for his, her weakness, or for her carnality, or for her spiritual purity. However, if the husband is failing in that particular function of sanctifying and cleansing her with the washing of water of the word, then and his wife is failing in her role as a wife uh, to glorify herself and her husband and her God, and she is failing in her walk with God and in her glorification of God, that husband is responsible, and he will be held accountable. 
because he is contributing to the problem instead of contributing the solution. If there is a husband that thinks that this might be the case in his home, he has to immediately change his priorities and prioritize, prioritize his wife's spiritual condition. He has to focus primarily on his wife. And he has to focus on building her up and edifying her however he can with the word of God. Yes, you have to think about how to do that. We have to look for opportunities and make opportunities for us to build up our wives and edify them uh, with the word of God. We have to encourage our wives to be right with God, to obey God, to serve God, and to glorify God. Uh, that husband must not stop obeying God or stop serving God or stop glorifying God, but he must understand that in order for him to best obey God, to best glorify God, he needs his wife's help. She is intended to be his help to help him to glorify his Lord. And so he needs to get her on the same page with his Lord and uh, with himself. If the husband doesn't think that this is the case in his home, uh, the husband still must actively make sure that it is. Uh, he has to continue to prioritize his wife's spiritual condition. Uh, that his, he has to continue to make sure that his wife has uh, the proper spiritual direction that he should be giving her. Uh, he should be making sure that his wife has an adequate walk with God. And he should making, be making sure that she is spending time in the Word of God, that he's spending time in the Word of God with his wife. The word spot here refers to either the sacrifices or the priests uh, being without imperfections or disease, uh, manifesting itself in unnatural spots or blemishes in the skin. That's the idea of spots. The word wrinkle. Wrinkle is only used once in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Old Testament. It's kind of interesting that he talks about not being, being without wrinkle, and yet there's, uh, it's, it's not easy to find the relation of that to uh, the Old Testament idea. I believe that the sacrifices and the high priest not having wrinkles uh, refers to them being in the prime of their lives as opposed to being old, you know, having wrinkles. <clears throat> and regarding the sacrifices, I believe that being without wrinkle refers to God's concern throughout the giving of the Mosaic Law that the sacrifices had to be young, right? How often do we see, as we read through the Old Testament, especially the Pentateuch, how uh, the uh, sacrifices were all supposed to be young, uh, of a year old or young. We see in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 18 through 19, he says, And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offerings, even offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats. A kid refers to a baby goat, a young goat. For a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offering. So here we see several examples of sacrifices that were supposed to be young, uh, that God doesn't want us to just give what's left over, what's about to die, or what's useless to us. He wants us to give what is uh, in the prime of its life. And also, regarding the high priest, this is interesting, uh, that I believe being without wrinkle refers to the age qualifications of the high priest. Uh, given in Numbers chapter 8, verses 23 through 26, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is it that belongeth unto the Levites, from twenty and five years old and upward, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And from the age 50 years, uh, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof, and they shall serve no more, but shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge and, and shall do, the serve, do no service. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites, touching their charge. So we hear talk about the ministry of the Levites. We talk about how... I believe that the preparation of the husband for his families, particularly his wife, is for that marriage supper of the Lamb, as though he is presenting his family to the Lord uh, for that service through eternity, and to have them as ready as possible for that time. And it's the same idea as, as the Levites being prepared for their greatest calling upon earth, which was to minister in the tabernacle. And so I'm... Uh, that's an interesting observation about the word wrinkle. 
Uh, and then he says, not having any such thing as spots or wrinkles, referring to anything indicating imperfections or disease contamination or an inability to be an ideal sacrifice or to be an ideal servant of the Old Testament temple. And so I believe in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, uh, that these physical re requirements that we see in the Old Testament are here being likened to how Christ wants the church to be spiritually, morally, and practically, how he wants them to be clean and sanctified and qualified to praise, serve, and glorify him the best possible, uh, both now and in the future. And we saw that although all these Old Testament terms in verses 26 through 27 can refer to both the Old Testament sacrifices and the Levitical priests, uh, I believe that they refer here to the preparation of the Levitical priests for service. Because you've got to liken it to something. And I don't think it's likening to both. I think it's um, referring to the Levitical priests. But it could be to both or to just uh, to the sacrifice. I'm not uh, dogmatic about that. I don't think the passage is. <clears throat> and then I want us also to see here that the glorious kind of church is one that will be holy and without blemish. Notice here the phrase at the end of verse 27, that might be holy and without blemish. The picture here is of the Old Testament offering of an animal or a priest. Both of them were to be holy and without blemish. It's an interesting thought. Uh, some might immediately turn to the thought of the sacrifice. In Leviticus chapter 22, verses 18 through 25, God tells Moses, Speak to Aaron and to his sons and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, Whatsoever he be of the house of Israel, out of the strangers of Israel, that will offer his oblation for all his vows and for all his free will offerings, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering, you shall offer at your own will a male without blemish. Notice the, the phrasing uh, between this passage I'm reading and Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verses 26 and 27. <clears throat> that the male must be without blemish of, of the beeves, of the sheep, or of the goats. But whatsoever hath the blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. And whosoever offereth the sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Blind, or broken, or maimed, or having a wen, or scurvy, or scabbed, you shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering of, by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. Either a bullock or a lamb, or that he hath any that hath anything superfluous or lacking in his parts, that that mayest thou offer for a free will offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. Ye shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised or crushed or broken or cut. Neither shall you make any offering thereof in your hand, neither from a stranger's hand shall you offer the bread of your God of any of these, if it has any of these issues also. Not even the bread is allowed to, because their corruption is in them, and the blemishes be in them. They shall not be acceptable for you. So we see there the picture of, from the Old Testament for this passage here in Ephesians chapter 5. But also, the same applies to the priest. In Leviticus chapter 21, verses 17 through 23, he says, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed or broken-handed, even if you broke your arm, you're not supposed to come to offer a sacrifice as a priest. Or crook-backed, or a dwarf, that's discriminatory, right? <laughs> oh no, it's socially unacceptable, you know? <clears throat> or a dwarf, or he that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken, uh, that would not be fun. No man that hath any, that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy. Hey, he can eat the holy bread, but
but he cannot go into the Holy of Holies. Only he shall not go into the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, do sanctify them. So we see there, I believe that that's the picture that Christ has when, he's, when we see the picture of, the, of Christ with his church and the husband with his wife. I believe that he's here referring to the idea of the priest, uh, not necessarily to the sacrifice. <clears throat> Uh, not to the idea of the animal offering, but to the offering of a priest to the Lord who is acceptable and capable of performing his role. That's the purpose for the priest not having these physical blemishes, uh, so that he is acceptable to the Lord and capable of performing his role. The Lord's intent for the offering of his church is to prepare it to not just be clean and holy, but to be without any contamination or damage from the world. Our Lord isn't concerned with those things in the, in the church meeting the, phys- the, the people in the church meeting the physical qualifications of a priest in the Old Testament. That's not the point. God doesn't care if we meet these physical qualifications of the priest. Our Lord is instead concerned with the idea that that represents uh, to a, a group of people that have been spiritually damaged a group of people who have not been contaminated, a group of people who have not been dirtied uh, by this world. Our Lord is concerned with having a church that's made up of those who do not just look good, that aren't just clean on the outside, but are sanctified within, who are spiritually cleansed, who are sanctified to be holy, who aren't caught up in the world and contaminated by it, who aren't carnal or spiritual babies, who show the ideal faithfulness and devotion that he expects, and who have shown themselves to be the kind of servants who adequately perform the roles and the functions that are assigned to them. We're talking about qualifications uh, for us to be the most glorifying to our Lord, uh, especially when uh, the judgment seat of Christ comes, and especially when the marriage supper of the bride comes. The husband should also be actively working on preparing his wife to please the Lord the best that she can, as being holy and without blemish. The husband has to do his best to keep his wife spiritually cleansed from worldliness, from carnality, and from spiritual immaturity. The husband has to do his best to keep his wife sanctified from sin unto her Lord. The husband has to do his best to make sure his wife is holy in her, in her lifestyle, and in her heart, and in her actions, and in her speech. And he's also to help her to be sanctified and to be faithful and devoted to her Lord. And to be adequate to handle the commandments and the service of her Lord. That's his goal. That's the goal of the husband. And so my final point, this is a rather rather short uh, sermon today. Uh, First hour was rather long and second hour was rather short. So for the husband to effectively perform his task, of having a wife that glorifies God and is ready to meet her God, the husband must be spiritually cleansed and sanctified himself. Not to be hypocritical, not to expect more of his wife than he expects of himself. And to be loving uh, toward her and to saturate her in the word of God. The husband must be willing to give up all of his desires, all of his goals, all of his aspirations that don't line up with God's will for him to make his family ready to stand before God. That is the the function, that is the role, that is the greatest calling of the husband, to have his family ready to stand before God. The husband must love his wife being selflessly and sacrificially devoted to her. And the husband must center his family's lives on the word of God, reading and learning, and knowing and applying God's word to his family, and by actively doing so, looking for opportunities to get his family into the word of God. And the husband must be dependent on the Lord's grace to accomplish this most important task. We need God's grace to be the biblical husbands that God wants us to be, the kind of husband that Christ exemplified in his treatment of the church. And so we need God's grace to do so. And so today, we saw how the church should prioritize the glorification of its Lord 
and how the husband should prioritize the glorification of his wife accordingly. We saw that we should that we, we should understand that the purpose for our focus uh, should be on making our wives and our families the best that they can be to glorify our Lord and to prepare them for eternity, for both the marriage supper of the Lamb and for the judgment seat of Christ to come. And then we saw that the husband must focus on his wife's glorification of her Lord by keeping her saturated in God's word, by doing the, his best to help her to be holy and without blemish just as Christ's focus on the church was to make it holy and without blemish. And so next week, we're going to see some more direction, even more direction for the husband, and how the husband can love his wife, how he should go about that. And it's going to be an interesting comparison, another simile uh, that we're going to see uh, for the husband and his wife to compare to. And so that was it for the second hour for the preaching. It was uh, rather short, but it was to the point. And that we have to do everything we can as a church to glorify our God and in our family as husbands to do what we can to help our wives and our children to glorify God, to prepare them for that time when we will all stand before Christ and that they will be the most ready that they can be to glorify their Lord. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the teaching of your word. We thank you for the power of your word. Uh, that it helps us to understand your will for our lives, that we understand what we should prioritize and how we should live our lives. We ask that you help every one of us to not live this life in service of ourselves or to be caught up with the, uh, with the, the fleeting moments and, and with the circumstances, but that we will take every one of those circumstances to glorify our Lord. Uh, we ask that you help us to do so this coming week. And that you be glorified in all of our lives more this coming week as well as in our families and in our church. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And also, Lord, we ask that you'll bless the food of our bodies. We thank you for it, for your provision of our needs and for this food and for the hands that prepared it. And we ask that you'll bless it to our bodies so we can honor and glorify you. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.